I was sitting in Old Testament class, my very first year of seminary, still getting lost in the building, trying to find my next classroom. And I remember sitting in that desk, just writing as fast as I possibly could, trying to keep up with the lecture when Dr. Phyllis Tribble, my professor, said that in the original Hebrew, the Red Sea might be better translated the Sea of Reeds. And my hand stopped writing. I was shocked. All of those years in Sunday school and felt boards in vacation Bible school and old biblical maps sitting in the corner of the room, it was all turned upside down. I had so many questions. Did my third grade Sunday school teacher know and keep this from me on purpose? And was Moses aware of this change and sign off on it? And what was I supposed to call it going forward? Then it dawned on me. It doesn't matter what you call it. It could be any waters in front of us that we have to cross. That Moses, Miriam, and the Hebrew people were escaping decades of oppression. They were running from the evils of slavery, chased by the powerful Egyptian army and standing on the banks of those waters. They did not care what it would be labeled on a map. All they cared about was crossing it and reaching freedom. And throughout our lives, we have to cross many bodies of water. They're not always as dire as the Hebrew people escaping slavery, but we are always searching for what is life giving. That we are longing for the steadfast love of God as we stand on the banks and look at the waters in front of us, whether it is navigating a chronic illness that has left us with new limitations where life does not look like it used to look, or whether it is lost dreams that have come crashing down around us because of circumstances outside of our control, and now we are trying to envision a different future or whether it is the heartache of feeling wronged by a friend or the heavy burden of carrying the weight of the regret of our own decisions. It could be the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds. All we know is we have to cross it. We find waters throughout all of Scripture, and God's assurance that we do not have to cross them alone. As the prophet Isaiah says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. That we have to wade into moving water. 
that have a current to them where there is risk and threat and danger, which echoes the meaning of baptism. In the early church, there is a document called the Didache. It's one of the earliest written records we have of the early church outside of the New Testament. It's a list of recommendations, sort of a handbook for how the church is to be the church. And it recommends that baptism take place in moving water. So it can reflect the risk of life and faith along with the faithfulness of God. That God carries us through those waters. It is the reason John Lewis led those marching for civil rights across the Alabama River crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. It was in search of what is life-giving, leading all of us to something better. And they walked in the ways of nonviolence. That the ways of nonviolence violence remind us that love is not just an emotion. It is a choice. It is an action. It is a way of life. I sat down with a couple years ago who were preparing to get married And they were telling me the story of their relationship, like those important moments, like the first time they told one another they loved each other, that apparently the groom had just come home from a date with his future fiance. And as he got home to his apartment, he sat down on the couch and his roommate, still up, asked him about this new relationship in his life. So he started to talk about the date and the relationship and all that it meant to him. And the more he talked, the more he excited he got, the more he lit up. So his roommate finally interjected and asked, do you love her? And he said, for the first time out loud, yes, I do love her. Well, after he had told his roommate, he felt compelled to tell her. So he got back into his car, drove over to her apartment to tell her this realization. And as he drove, he was a ball of nerves, trying to figure out what he was going to say. So he walked up to her apartment and knocked on the door, and she opened up the door, standing there, and he delivered this speech that he had prepared on his drive over. He talked about all the wonderful things about her. He talked about how the recent weeks had been so meaningful to him, how they had made him think about his life differently, and that on that night, he had this realization that he needed to tell her, I love you. And she stood there in the doorway, holding it open, not saying a word for what felt like days. And she finally said, Um, can I get some clarification about what you mean by love? It was not what he expected. But she knew love is more 
than an emotion. It is a way of life. It's why Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive a church member who sins against me? Seven times? And Peter was trying to be generous. That's not a second chance. That's a seventh chance. And Jesus says, no. Seventy-seven times. Because love is a way of life. It does not have an expiration date. And it is about God's forgiveness. Like that servant who owed 10,000 talents that he begged for mercy. He begged for patience. And then his debt, as big as it was, was forgiven. He did not have to pay even a cent. But then he leaves that room and runs into the person who owes him a hundred denarii, a much smaller amount of money. And that person begged for forgiveness. But he would not forgive that debt, even though he had been forgiven. Now, to be clear, This is not a doormat kind of forgiveness where we leave room for harm or abuse. That it is a forgiveness that stands up for what is right. But it is a forgiveness that is a way of life. Whenever we stand on the edge of a river and we have no other choice but to cross it, we need the strength of God's love, that we need the ways of patience, meekness, gentleness. We need the ways of grace, forgiveness, justice. We need the ways of peace, self-control, and love, that we need the ways of Jesus. But it is difficult standing there on the bank of that river because there is usually pain or fear involved. Richard Rohr recommends when we are standing on the bank of that kind of river, that we embrace a prayer of welcome. That we, as strange as it sounds, welcome our pain and our fear. That we embrace it. That we stop fighting it. That we stop blaming others. We stop putting conditions on our forgiveness. That instead, We welcome our pain and our fear because it is only then that we can move forward. That we can then take our fear and pain and place it in the hands of God, knowing that we no longer have to carry it by ourselves. Now, it doesn't happen all at once. It only happens slowly and over time. But it's how we take one step after another, crossing the waters in front of us, where we return again and again to the ways of Jesus in order to find our way. For the book of Acts calls the church 
the people of the way. The ways of God's steadfast love. Amen.